CNN Breaking News. Well, we begin with the breaking news. Bright orange flames lighting up the night sky as bloody protests rip through Ukraine's capital. Lots at stake right now, including for the United States and the European Union. At least 14 people are dead. Americans are being warned to stay indoors. CNN's Phil Black is joining us from Kiev right now. Phil's on the phone. What is the latest? Because these pictures, Phil, have been so dramatic all day. Reminds me of Tahrir Square in Cairo. Yeah, indeed. It certainly has very much a revolutionary feel to it. Also, I'm standing not far from those bonfires. You can probably see in that live feed. And really, I'm surrounded by thousands of people who are going out of the way. They're clearly prepared to try and hold this space. They say that Ukrainian security forces tried to force their way through here earlier this evening, broke through some of their lines and barricades, but then withdrew. They are now with we are now rebuilding those barricades. They have lit those bonfires to create really a bed of fire and burning embers across the road. It's all part of a, a defensive attempt at keeping back the security forces from mounting any sort of defensive operation to clear the square. That's what they fear. Certainly the language coming from the Ukrainian government today clearly blames the opposition crowd and the violence that has taken place on the streets of Kiev. The people surrounding me certainly refute that, but they believe that the government is going to use that violence today as an excuse to come through here and do something that they've no doubt been keen to do for a couple of months now, and that is clear out this square that has been occupied since November and reassert the government's authority here, Walt. And I know that our connection is not that great, understandably so, Phil, but what the, the, the government there in Kiev, they, they're with Putin and Moscow, those in the opposition who are resisting, they're, they want to have a better relationship with the European Union and the United States. Is that, is that the big issue right now, or are there other domestic issues that we need to know about? No, that, that, well, that was really the issue that triggered all of this. So people first took to the streets because they want Ukraine to be closer to Europe. The government had said, no, we're going to go closer to Russia. What they've been fighting for since is a change to the Constitution that will lessen the powers of the president, and then they want new elections to elect a new government and a new president because they believe the majority of the country is with them and wants to go closer to Europe. It's hard to know how accurate that is. Certainly the country is divided somewhere close to 50-50, pro-Europe, pro-Russia, but the people around me here on the streets certainly want the president and the government to go. And it looks, Phil, like there's no, no easing of this, uh, this opposition of, of what's going on right now. It looks as, as intense as it was a few hours ago. I think we've lost our connection with Phil Black. We'll try to reconnect with him. He's in Kiev. But I want to go to our own Nick Payton Walsh, our other international correspondent. He's joining us from Sochi, Russia, right now. And Nick, you know Kiev. You know Ukraine. Well, you've reported there uh, quite frequently. What's at stake here? Specifically, what's at stake for the West, especially the United States? Well, this is the long decade, at least drawn out, almost battle, if you were, about which direction the country goes. It is split in many ways itself between an East that faces towards Russia, that's close industrially to Russia's economy, and a West that sees Poland's economic development right next door and wants in on that. The language of those two parts of the country are different too, but they share one government, and that government has been torn between those two ideas over the past 10 years. What's at stake in the immediate short term is the safety and the lives of those people inside that square, because many are concerned at this point that President Viktor Yanukovych very much has his back against the wall. Those protesters too are boxed into that square, many witnesses say, but he politically has tried negotiation, didn't get him where he wanted, he had, wouldn't have to give up too much to really calm the protests. They're all about removing him from power really now. And in terms of his sponsors, well, Moscow and many hardliners, they would like to see him take a firmer line, perhaps, against the protesters. That's what we're seeing on the streets maybe now. The question, Wolf, and the thing I think that people are worried about is that nobody really anticipated this to happen in the middle of the Sochi games behind me. That Vladimir Putin would want this to play out at all, slam in the middle of his $51 billion spectacle. The question is, it seems like the police are reacting to events on the ground rather than dictating them. That's very dangerous, Wolf. And, and from the U.S. perspective, Nick, uh, tell, tell our viewers how the United States fits into this battle that is now in the streets of the U Ukrainian capital. 
Well, I have to say, I mean, the US position on this hasn't been particularly forthright. I mean, they've had a nominal support for the Western uh, pro-Western opposition there. They've wanted to discourage violence. And I think in many ways they would like to have seen Viktor Yanukovych swing in a westerly direction too. But 10 years ago, it was quite different. Colin Powell, George Bush, uh, that administration really laid it on thick, trying to get the West uh, to pull Ukraine towards it. It worked temporarily. Viktor Yushchenko won the 2004 Orange Revolution, but he failed in many ways as a president to deliver on what he promised. Now the country swung back towards Russia, towards Viktor Yanukovych, who was Yushchenko's opponent way back then. The question for the US is this massive country that sits between Russia and uh, Eastern Europe as well, vital in many ways, a huge part of that part of the world's identity and a huge part of Russia's political orbit. Does it stay with Moscow? or does it move towards the West? The US, of course, want the latter to happen. Many Ukrainians want that too. And the wider geopolitical issue at stake here is that US-Russia tug for influence over different parts uh, of the European continent. So that's what's playing out here. The US have, it's fair to say, taken their eyes off the ball a little bit in the past few months. They've been uh, lacking in the same financial will to support the Ukrainian economy, along with the EU, that the Russians have shown. That's why Yanukovych was able to to keep going in the Russian direction because they offered billions of cash to bail the economy out and keep, uh, keep people in jobs, frankly. Uh, frankly. So I think that's what we're seeing play out here. We haven't heard the same strident statements that we heard back in 2004 from the White House yet, but if this violence continues, we may well do. We so those pictures are so dramatic. I assume we'll be hearing a lot more from the U.S. administration. Nick Payton Walsh uh, joining us as well. Elise Labatt is here. She's our foreign affairs reporter. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, we haven't heard a lot of condemnation, a lot of major statements coming in from the president or the secretary of state, the secretary of defense. They're talking about it, but I'm not hearing you know, a lot of outrage yet. That's because they're concerned about two things, Wolf. A, they're concerned about the government cracking down on the square and trying to clear out all the protesters, and they don't want to see the government make a dramatic move. But when you see these pictures, uh, the streets on fire, the opposition has a lot of responsibility here, too. So they are reaching out to the opposition to say, look, you have to dial this back. We've been in support of your uh, protests and your right to uh, speak your mind, but they certainly don't want to see what they're seeing right now. The State Department sending out a warning to U.S. Uh, citizens on the ground, stay inside, do not get outside. Not only do they not want to get caught, U.S. citizens to get caught up in the violence, but they also understand that the government is getting ready to make a pretty major crackdown on that square, and they don't want U.S. citizens to get caught up and in that. And that could be really, really ugly. Uh, if I mean, it's already ugly right now. This is Kiev. Uh, this is a, in the middle of the, uh, the Winter Olympic Games, not very far away in Sochi, Russia. So from the U.S. perspective, what do we anticipate happening? Will the U.S. become more assertive, shall we say, or are they going to let the uh, Ukrainians basically handle this by themselves? There's a limit to what U.S. influence and power in that part of the world is, after all. Well, you saw last week, I think that the reason this is taking everybody by surprise is because over the past few weeks, there was some progress in terms of getting the government and the opposition to sit down and possibly work on a national unity government. We had that little blip, if you remember, with Victoria Nuland, that uh, leaked phone conversation with the U.S. ambassador um, saying some disparaging things about the European Union involvement. But that's because the U.S. wanted the Europeans to get a lot more involved and, and be a lot tougher and, and use the power of the purse, not just in terms of helping the economy, but threatening sanctions. I'm told by U.S. officials there are sanctions ready to go on the government if there's a crackdown on the square, if the government does not take moves to put together a national unity government. But I think Nick um, is very correct in saying this is, you know, a lot in some ways about a proxy between the U.S. and Russia. You know, you've heard Secretary Kerry uh, say Wait, hold that... Hold on a second. Hold on. You're, you're listening. You're hearing those explosions now rocking the streets of Kiev uh, right now. Uh, every few seconds, another... Exp I, mean, I can only hope that uh, more people aren't being hurt or, or killed. There's another one uh, just there as well. Stand by for a moment. Barbara Starr is monitoring what's going on from her vantage point over at the Pentagon. Uh, Barbara, what do they say over there? about uh, these explosions, these firebombs, uh, all this uh, violence that's now unfolding in Kiev. He's just like we are. Uh, I've spoken to some U.S. military officials in the last minutes. So far, no requests from the U.S. ambassador there, we are told, 
for any U.S. military reinforcement of the embassy or uh, specific assistance uh, to get American citizens out of there. That could change uh, in the coming hours if this grows worse. Uh, they are very aware here of the advisory for Americans to stay away, to stay indoors, to not get caught up in this. Uh, but, you know, the U.S. military has a very strong relationship with some of the nations in this region. And in fact, uh, the Marines and the Navy are planning a deployment to the Black Sea shortly uh, and will go into this region. We'll see if they make any port calls in Ukraine. If this violence continues, that may be one of the first things to go because typically you will not find the U.S. military docking in countries uh, that engage in this kind of activity. That's a very strong military diplomatic signal that can be sent. But, you know, I'm like, uh, I'm with you and Elise as, and, and Phil and uh, Nick as I watch this. This seems to be outright military action uh, by all accounts against these civilians. Wolf? These pictures are so dramatic. Uh, we're going to stay on top of the breaking news out of Kiev. Look at what's going on right now after midnight on the streets of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. We'll continue the breaking news as new explosions rock the capital right after this.